Some leading scientists say fewer animals are being brought into the UK for medical research because of pressure by animal rights activists. They say ferry companies and airlines have refused to transport the animals. Calls now on the question that was put to the panel. If you ran an airline or a ferry company, would you give free passage to mice on their way to a medical research laboratory? Uh, first, Nick Palmer will go to. Hello. Hello. Um, I'm the director of policy with the BUAV, which is one of the uh, leading campaigns in the area. We've been uh, asking our supporters to write politely and peacefully to the airlines, primarily on the primate trade. That the primates are brought in from Mauritius and Vietnam. Um, they're generally the offspring of wild court primates, uh, which is an unpleasant business. The transport is very difficult for them and when they arrive it's important to stress that they are often used not for the kind of uh, treatment of diseases that was discussed by the panel but for general uh, information and uh, abstract research and if I may uh, give a brief example just so we, we know what we're talking about um, you know when you shut your eyes, you get, uh, if you've been watching TV, you get an afterimage on, on the eyelids. And the experimenters in Oxford were interested in this. So they, they got some, uh, some monkeys who'd been imported, and they sawed their skulls open, put it in electrodes, and then forced their eyes open for five days to see whether the afterimages were reflected in brain activity. And one can't say that doesn't produce information, it does, but we, it's something we already knew about humans. And they were interested to see if monkeys had the same patterns. Understood. Um, can I bring you, could I bring you yeah. Mr Palmer, to the, the, the question which was put by the, 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 the member of the audience and which was brought up by the fact of the decision made by the airlines and the ferry companies, that mice specifically, which I'm told make up the great majority of the import of, of animals, and the scientists in response are saying they're extremely concerned about this because diseases, cancer, motor neuron, and a host of other diseases, the research in that area absolutely needs mice that have been specially developed for that purpose. You say you're mainly concerned about primates, and a lot of people feel very, very uncomfortable about that, particularly if it's not for pure medical research, but simply as inquiry. But mice for motor neuron disease, I put it crudely. What's your stance on that? Uh, yeah, I wouldn't say that we're only concerned about primates. Uh, but our campaign's been on primates. But the, um, what we'd say on mice, on primates, on dogs, on cats, and all the, all the animals that are being imported, um, is that it is not fair to examine the issue of imports in isolation what we need is an open and mature debate about the type of experiments that are being done. Understood. Part of, that debate, part of that debate is, is of course, ongoing, and you're part of that debate. Yeah. Let me just, once more, if I could, though, if, oh, you, if you personally believed, or if you were persuaded by scientists who may have far greater, bound to have far greater medical knowledge than even you might have, that a particular use of a mouse will move forward the ability to combat motor neuron disease. Would you rule that in or rule that out? The position, I've worked in the pharmaceutical industry for 18 years, and the position, unfortunately, is that because humans are not large mice, um, we don't, we are not in that situation. And the, but excuse me, uh, just for a second, the, uh, scientists will tell us again and again that we are in that position, that they can extrapolate from what happens well, to reason, mice. The reason, unfortunately, we don't have a solution to motor neuron disease, although we've had many years of research on this. Well, you could take cancers. If you, you take cancers, there are well, specific take, examples. Yeah, take cancer. The, um, one of the leading American scientists working for the Food and Drug Administration commented that we well, are now experts at curing cancer in mice. Um, and he said the problem is that none of the uh, treatments that they developed through the mice uh, cures have been transferable. And what I would stress is that um, what our supporters have been saying to the ferry companies and the airlines is not um, any kind of pressure or um, threat, as some of the panel seem to think, 
They're simply saying that we would prefer to travel with airlines like British Airways, which don't take part in the process that causes animal suffering, and not with an airline like Air France, which does take part in it. And I think that is legitimate consumer pressure, and it's part of the overall debate that we really want to have on moving forward from outdated techniques to, so that Britain can be a okay. world leader in the alternatives. They may or may not have won the argument, but anti-vivisection campaigners appear to have won an important battle against the use of animals in scientific research. Ferry companies, the last being Stenner, have pulled out of the business of transporting animals for research. At least one of them has said it's scared of negative publicity and possibly worse consequences that might fall upon them at the hands of campaigners. But what effect will it have on science in the UK? Professor Robin Lovell-Badge is a geneticist at the National Institute for Medical Research is with us in the studio. Good morning. Good morning. Um, what animals do you use specifically for, for your research? We use mice. So we're, we're using um, a lot of genetically modified uh, mice. So these are mice carrying mutations that are of interest for, for us and our collaborators in other countries. Um, or that can be used for assays, for example, doing cancer research, things like that. Right. Now, the, the number of mice that, or the number of animals in total that are imported for scientific use is, it seems rather a small proportion of the total. It's very small, and that's simple, simply because you will import perhaps just a breeding pair, you know, male and a female, um, and, and then once you get them in your, your own lab, you will then uh, breed those up to establish a colony. Right. Um, in, in the UK. John and I, after, after, after sort of brushing up on this this morning, we're, we're talking, the, the numbers do seem incredibly large of, the, of, of animals in, in use in experimentation. I think Tom, our science editor, yeah. was saying it's 1%, 15,000, implies we're using a million animals a year or something. For oh, yes, but, uh, but you know, the, these, are, these are the uh, sort of official records that the Home Office um, keeps. But, I mean, how uh, could the, we be using a million animals a year? Well, That's actually, the vast majority of procedures used on animals are things like just breathing. Cancer is a, a procedure. So vast majority of these animals are mice. Um, the vast majority of animals used in research are mice. Um, and uh, it's, they breed a lot. And every time a, a, a genetically altered animal breeds, that cancer is a procedure. Right. So right. there's no... It doesn't mean it that... It doesn't mean it's, uh, anything's been done to it other than that it's been bred... Correct. But you don't keep a million animals sitting around f other than for doing stuff to them, presumably. Oh, no, no, no. We, we, we keep the number of animals that we use to actually to the bare minimum. So, uh, and that's a requirement for the Home Office regulations that uh, now, we do that. Is it, how big an effect is this going to have? I mean, clearly you'll have to home grow animals if, instead of importing them if the if the ferry companies for whatever reason say we're not going to carry these animals well the the, the different reasons for for importing animals so one is as i said is to to share reagents with collaborators and and others uh, in in different countries and that's very important that you work with the same you know try and understand the the same animal um, this can be for um, assay development, where you where you need to have the same animal to test drugs and compare drugs with other people working in other countries. Um, and uh, um, there are also cases where you know it's not cost effective for there to be lots of little animal breeding companies. So you'll have one big, right, very well uh, maintained animal breeding company outside of the outside UK. Of the UK. Yeah. Um, Lord Paul Drayson is also with us, who's a science minister in the last government. Good morning. Morning. Um, is this a business Britain should be in? There clearly is quite a substantial portion of the public who find it very distasteful, and, uh, and, and maybe the Brits should just say, if the public don't like it, we're not going to do it. I think that would be completely wrong. I think that we need to recognise that, regrettably, it is not possible to develop new medicines to ensure that they're safe without doing this animal research. And so, therefore, if we do want to have access to medicines, and I, I believe that we do, more than 87% of the general public consistently over the last 10 years in polling have said that they support animal research for medical uses. And so, unfortunately, we do have to do this. Right. Now, if, you, if you're a politician and you decide we need to be in this business or we want to be in this business and you think the public are behind you, 
Why worry about the ferry companies? If you want to bring those animals in, there's a government, I know you're not in the government anymore, but if you want to bring animals in, we can just fly them in. I mean, we can get them, we can bring the, the Air Force, can just go and pick them up and bring them in. I mean, it's... But I think, I think society has to recognise that it's not about the government stepping in to provide a solution to this problem. It's about society as a whole recognising that if we wish this work to be done, then we need to support those parts of our community that have to do their particular parts of the process to get it done. So what the extremists have done successfully over the years is to identify weak links in the chain and to target the people at those weak links to be able to stop the process like as a the, whole. Like ferry companies, for example. Precisely. So what do you want to do about it? I think the important thing is for the government to work with the transport industry as a whole the transport industry, so the Department of Transport, um, uh, to get together, to get agreement that all transport companies, whether they're airlines or ferries, will support the transport of animals. So if they all do it, it'll be harder for one. And therefore, people cannot be picked off. Lord Drayson and Robin Lovell Badge, thank you both for coming in. The use of animals in medical experiments has always been highly controversial in this country. Protesters have been prepared to go to jail to stop it happening. Scientists and companies involved have been intimidated to the extent that some have simply stopped doing it. Well, now it's back in the headlines. An investigation by this programme has revealed how a new campaign by animal rights activists has succeeded in picking off the airlines, ports and ferry companies involved in transporting laboratory animals one by one. And scientists are warning that the campaign could succeed where more direct direct confrontational protests against firms like Huntington Life Sciences in Cambridge uh, have failed. If researchers can't get access to specialist breeding facilities all over the world, they claim the UK will struggle to maintain its position at the forefront of medical research and drug discoveries, new drug discoveries, will suffer. Our science correspondent Tom Fielden reports. <laughs> A roll-on, roll-off ferry docks and begins to unload its cargo at the cross-channel port of Dover. Until recently, an admittedly tiny proportion of that freight might have included a consignment of animals, typically genetically modified mice, bred for use in biomedical research. But not anymore. According to documents seen by this programme, the last of the major ferry companies willing to carry laboratory animals, Stena, pulled out in January this year. When a few companies were affected and chose not to transport animals, that wasn't a game changer. One of the few scientists willing to speak out on this issue is Dominic Wells, the Professor of Translational Medicine at the Royal Veterinary College. But it's now getting to the point where enough companies have been intimidated and have refused to transport animals that we can see a potential worldwide impact of having problems transporting animals between labs that will massively impact on the collaborative nature of research and will slow research progress. Although transportation only accounts for a small fraction of the overall number of procedures carried out on laboratory animals, movements between breeders and scientific institutions have become increasingly important as the sophistication of animal models has improved. The ability to genetically engineer mice to express human proteins has made them a much more useful tool for studying disease but it's also increased the scientific community's reliance on specialist breeders, typically based in Europe. Our problem is they can't be put in a suitable transport and just driven from country to country because we have the channel in the way. Uh, and so with the blockade that is rapidly developing, we're going to essentially be isolated from the rest of Europe. And that will have huge impact on the UK competitiveness and on the very good work that's done in an awful lot of UK labs. But this vital component of the trade in laboratory animals has also presented a new target for animal rights campaigners to exploit. I was sickened to hear that you have refused to sign a pledge of not handling any animals destined for research purposes. The tactics employed by activists will be familiar to all those involved in biomedical research. This is an extract from a letter circulated on the internet that campaigners were encouraged to send to port officials and senior staff 
at Dover. The port of Dover is used on a weekly basis to transport primates, beagles and other species to be burnt, gassed, poisoned and electrocuted inside vivisection facilities. Although there's no explicit threat, the reputation of animal rights extremists for aggressive and intimidatory campaigning, most recently at Huntingdon Life Sciences near Cambridge and at Oxford University's new biomedical research laboratory, seems to have been enough. One of the first to pull out was the national carrier British Airways. And when P&O ferries followed suit in May last year, DFDS and many of the smaller carriers and the ports and handling agents went with them. I think it's a major problem, a problem of great significance to the UK. The chief executive of the Association of the British Pharmaceutical Industry, Stephen Whitehead. Because this research cannot go anywhere else. We have the intellectual capacity, we have the industrial capacity, we have a supportive government committed to life sciences. We want this discovery work to be taking place in the UK. Life sciences is a jewel in the crown of our economy. Like the previous Labour administration, the coalition government has nailed its economic colours firmly to the life sciences sector. Speaking at a conference organised by the Financial Times earlier this year, the Prime Minister emphasised the crucial role of biomedical research in building a new knowledge-based economy fit for the 21st century. Now, the two reports we're publishing today are testament to our ambition. Not just to sort of hang in there with a significant foothold in the global market, but to try and take an even bigger share of that market in the years to come. Ensuring the UK does win a bigger share of that market will in part hinge on whether scientists can get the animal models they need to carry out basic research into treatments for disease. Tom Field and reporting there. Well, I'm joined in the studio by the science minister, David Willits. Um, you worried about it? I think it is a serious problem that we do need to tackle because the fact is that we've got excellent research in Britain. In fact, we can be very proud of the fact that almost 20 of the world's top 100 drugs were created and invented in Britain. That's made a fantastic contribution to well-being around the world. We need to carry on doing that. And for that, as scientists do need, in very carefully controlled conditions with very high standards of animal welfare, they do need to be able to conduct experiments and tests involving animals. So why don't you say to them, OK, we'll put all these mice in our airplanes and bring them in that way? Well, we've got two very large grown-up sectors here. There's the pharmaceutical sector and there's the transport sector. And what we've been trying to do since this problem arose in January is we've been working very closely with both of them and we are trying to hammer out a deal in which both the life sciences industry agree a kind of code of conduct, a code of practice, exactly how animals, and it's, we're normally talking about mice here, will be transported and in return the transport industry and we would hope it would be a significant number of players, not individual players, but a significant number that would all agree that they would continue to transport animals. Yeah, but you failed. You tried to do that and you failed. Well, we, that's what we're still working on. I don't think it's uh, right to say that it's failed. We well, still though, hope... everybody Tom Fielden has been talking to seems to think it has. Well, that's what we still hope that we can put together because it makes sense for everyone. It makes sense for the life science industry to confirm and absolutely be clear on the very high standards, not just in their labs, but the very high standards when animals, as I say, usually mice, are being transported. And equally, whereas for individual transport companies who find it unpleasant to receive these emails, if as a sector as a whole they all agree that they will all be involved in transporting these animals, often on quite a small scale, yeah, but at that point it becomes a deal which we think everybody should be able to fine, sign up but, to. But there's a big if in all that, if they agree. But if they don't, and they show no sign of it at the moment, and unfortunately we can't talk to any of them because they won't talk to us, so no good me trying to put these questions to them. Um, if they say no, if they're so scared, of these people who haven't actually, as far as I can tell, threatened them with anything dire, have they? The yes, our understanding is the, the emails and the letters have been, you could say they were um, aggressive, you could say they were threatening, but they have not actually specifically threatened physical yeah, violence, It's not another hunting in life sciences. No, and, I, and that's why, again, and I think most importantly, if you look at the uh, discussions you've been having, including on this program today, we should all just say this is standing up for scientific research, which is of great benefit to humankind. Well, they know that. I mean, they're just being wimps, aren't well, they? 
Well, they, when you say they know, I think also to assure people once again that the standards of animal care in our research labs are probably the best in the world. If there's any single place where you can be confident yeah. of high standards, it's in Britain. And we're going to carry on making that case and carry on working with both the life science industry and the transport sector. Right, uh, but <laughs> the fact that the transport sector is refusing to do it, I mean, it makes them look pretty pathetic, doesn't it? Well, I can understand what happens if you're sort of an individual company receiving these letters. But as I say, I it's think... It's going we... to all of them. Yeah. yeah, but I think what's happened is individuals have peeled off successively but over the months. have they? I mean, even an individual, a big company, we're not talking about little tiny one-man bands here. We're talking about big uh, ferry operators who operate and have been operating for many years, hundreds of thousands of employees, and they say they get a few letters, a few mails, and they say, oop, we're not going to do it. Well, surely you think that's pathetic, don't well, you? I think for the individual ferry companies there, and other transport companies, they've, see, they've seen this feeling they were on their own, and they have uh, responded to the to the pressure. What well, we're what trying I'm to say is, is now... that that's rather wimpish. Do you well, agree? <laughs> I, look, I'm trying to work <laughs> with these sectors. You're being very diplomatic. I'm not, I'm not on this, uh, I understand the position of the life sciences sector. I understand the position of the transport sector. What we're trying to do constructively is to reach a solution where everybody understands that we agree nowhere. all this together. No, we've actually, in the past two months, we've been doing a lot of work, speaking to the individual transport companies, working with the life sciences industry, um, proposing a, this kind of draft code of conduct so everybody understands exactly the conditions in which animals will be All transported, right. and I'm continuing to work on that. Right, well, let's return to my question then. If you fail, and let's accept that you're trying very hard indeed, but if you fail, and it must be a possibility, given their record, if you fail, why not put these little mice on a, in a box and stick them on an R airplane and fly them into Bryce Norton or something, and then <laughs> the industry can carry on doing what you want it to do? Well, I think it would be a pity if we ended up in this sect saying that this... this process of transporting animals, which in most advanced Western company, countries happened, it well, happens all across pity, the continent, kind of had to be nationalised and taken over by the military in the UK. I very much hope well, that that does not arise. Nationalising, would you have been helping them out? You'd be saying, look, we've got a bit of empty space on that Hercules, you can have it. Well, I think the, the army may think that they had sort of other key functions to discharge. But look, what we're trying to they do... They do what you tell them. We have not... We are not at that stage. What I, am, what I still think we can achieve with very high standards of animal welfare in our labs, with a new code of practice on transport, and with the transport sector as a whole seeing their responsibilities, I still hope that we can reach a solution, which means we carry on having world-class research in Britain. David Willett, thanks very much. I should say we've also been trying to talk to some of the protesters, the activists, but um, no, no joy there either, I'm afraid.